Hello. On the screen now, you'll see a link to a video I previously did called Introduction to Multiband Compression. This video is an introduction to Dynamic EQ. The reason I mentioned the multiband compression one is because we'll deal with these at first a little bit simultaneously. There are some similarities between the two of them. Um, you'll see both of these processes used in live and you'll hear about their use and you'll hear about the fact that they're available on um, decent live sound consoles. There are some similarities but there are also differences that we can identify in terms of when they should be used. So we're going to use the same source audio as we did in the multiband compression video. It's, so it's got the same problem. And which would be best addressed? Would it either be with multiband compression or would it be with dynamic EQ or none of the above? Let's find out, shall we? So first up, um, just the basics of how, well, what dynamic EQ is and then how to get it on the desk. So, first of all, how to get it on the desk, and then we can see a picture on the screen. Uh, on the uh, Allen & Heath SQ series, you can get a dynamic EQ, but it's in the extra bundles or extra individual plugins. So you need to go to the Allen & Heath web store uh, and get it for the console. And incidentally as well, just because you have a license to put it on, for example, SQ7, which this console is, you have to have another license to have it on SQ6 and another license to have it on, for example... Uh, a D Live console. But by the way, these are the same plugins that are available across the Allen and Heath range. Uh, in this particular case, with this Dynamic EQ, for example, and the multiband compressor uh, that's also installed on this desk. So, uh, reasonably highly regarded processors, in so much as they are ones that you can also find on higher price point consoles from this company, Allen and Heath. Right, on the effects tab this is where they get inserted so in spite of the fact that normally you would be um selecting a channel going to process in and this is where you would expect to see an insert and in fact we have an insert point here let's go in a little closer on that and get that insert up that's where you can do the patching for the insert but it doesn't take you to the actual dynamic eq or indeed multiband compressor if you use the multiband compressor on the desk where you need to go to get those is the effects rack so we'll load a multiband compressor and a dynamic eq into the effects racks and then i'll show you how to patch them on the channel itself in that insert point so here in the effects rack if you go to library then you get a list of plugins that you can possibly have on the desk. I say possibly because the first ones uh, come with the console anyway, reverbs, delays, modulators, gated reverb. But then the ones further down the list, um, you need to, these are the ones that you get as extra, uh, paid extras, DSs. And then we can go to Dynamic EQ. There are some presets here, but I would just say go for flat. Presets and Dynamic EQs, not sure. Uh, especially not in live, too many moving targets. For me, I'd rather start with a flat. Um, so, so I'm not against presets for some stuff, uh, things with high-pass filters on, for example, but, uh, but with um, certain gate presets, but with dynamic EQs, I just would go for flat and go recall. And that's, there's a dynamic EQ. So... Just to throw back to the multiband compression video, again linked on screen now, I actually demonstrated that um, through Waves uh, C4. That's a really commonly used um, multiband compressor, and hopefully you'll also find that in, available in some of the studio work that you might do, either here at Spirit Studios or indeed elsewhere. But there is a multiband uh, compressor available for Allen Heath Console, this, this SQ, and there it is. Now, this video isn't going to go through the parameters of that, uh, but so that you know, that is there, and that is how you would load that on the desk. Uh, so, we will this time insert the dynamic EQ on this uh, challenging vocal, and how we do that is we go to processing, and then we go to effects rack, and say, oh, it's already done. Well, there you go. Uh, you would click on that and you would choose, scroll through, choose where you want the signal to come from, where you want the signal to come back from, but to onto the fader. And then switch it on. 
Little light comes on. This isn't an on and off switch. The only place to switch the insert point on is on the screen on the insert point. So this comes after the gate, but before the EQ and before the compression. Let's just actually get rid of anything else that could be on this channel. So we'll just do that. Okay. You can reset it, um, the EQ, to do that. You would. Hold reset and then with the channel in mind selected you then hold reset down and you click the in button right there on the EQ. Okay so I'll remind you what the problematic vocal was or what the problem with the vocal was. So I mean it's decent band and everything it's just that uh, basically this guy's got the wrong mic in front of him. It's a uh, um, uh, hypercardioid mic and he's going off axis uh, and that's causing tonality to be skewed at certain points in the track and it it's just not a consistent sound and things things change in it music's not an issue um if it makes sense and if it drives emotion and if it pushes the excitement or whatever it is that the creation is supposed to be doing for the listeners but when it's just change for technical sake as opposed to t change for intentional music sake it's not so good i mean you listen to the guy singing on the studio version of the track and he don't it doesn't sound it, the tonality doesn't skew in the same way as it does with this uh, live vocal as he goes off axis and then comes back on so basically the tight pickup pattern of the mic was just too unforgiving uh, with the way that this guy was performing. Uh, so here is the vocal. I'm going to mute myself when I play this back. So uh, this is, just make sure we've not got any processing on it. Um, just vocal uh, as it is, live from stage. My mind's Okay, so the problem is uh, this skewing of tonality and in order to find... It's also a level difference, we should point out. There is a level difference here. But it's not so much just the level change that is the issue. It's the fact that it's level changing more so within certain parts of tone, tone that's the issue. So it's... This is the thing with mentioning multiband compression and dynamic EQ at this very introductory point because it's it could be a candidate for one or the other of those two additional processors. I mean, firstly, I've left it on this page because it could just be a, a candidate for broadband uh, compression or indeed broadband EQ. The thing with broadband compression, though, is that especially with a live vocal, we don't want to apply more compression than we need to because it's going to bring up the spill because we turn down the loudest moments that the vocalist does and then we turn everything up and the everything includes stuff in the background, the spill. In this case, I will apply some broadband compression, but I'll apply that at the end and switch between the processes and you can see what it's doing. But it's not going to be the entire solution to this challenge because... It's the fact that certain parts of tone change in level. I'll play that again. So it's the tone that moves around in level. Now, you could EQ. The thing with that would be that the EQ change would hold through all the track. If you identified what sounded too much, overloaded certain parts of tone, not overloaded in terms of the system, but overloaded in terms of your ears and what you want to hear, uh, you could identify what that, for want of a better word, if it's annoying you, area of tone is and, and, and bring it back a little bit in level. But then it's there on the whole track. And it's not an issue with the whole track. It's just certain moments like the one that I've highlighted and looped in Pro Tools uh, on that playback engine of the live recording. So, Broadband EQ uh, is actually where we're going to start this because I'm going to use this to identify where I think the problem is. 
uh, and it's in a couple of it's in a couple of it's a couple of filters actually that I'll use to identify where those are. But then ultimately, um, I'm not going to do it on the parametric EQ because that would be there for the whole track, uh, and I'm going to do it on the dynamic EQ, which is going to selectively selectively for the frequencies I choose compress gain reduce those frequencies at certain points in the track rather than parametric EQ does it right throughout the track unless I manually go like that with the filters so first of all to identify where I think the problems are uh, usual things apply uh, listen uh, and uh, ear training comes into this, so you'll listen and you'll hear, oh, and you'll think maybe it's the mid-range that varies and also something a bit higher up in the high mid-range that varies. Uh, and it, it actually, those two things vary at different times within this, even just a short loop. Listen again. So it's like, at first... Uh, is the is the HF that is really just oh it's a bit too much and then somewhere around here and then somewhere in the mid range is just a bit too much so it's as he um, holds and then comes down toward the end of that phrase in terms of his pitching and uh, so it's two filters it's a two filter job. And it's not like this right throughout the track, so I don't want to take away from other elements of the of the of the not just one song, of course. This could be a whole set, so even more so, uh, we we don't want to do cuts permanently. So this reminds us uh, of a really cool new update in version uh, one point five for Alan and Heath, which is the RTA. I am so excited. Uh, right now that this console has got uh, an RTA because of course the M32, the X32 uh, had uh, the RTA and now this does in that same price point. If you want to go through and um, adjust settings for the RTA, first of all you can switch it on and off. I'll go through this in more detail in a separate video at some point but just for now, uh, one of the things that you could say that Alan Heath has had an RTA since version oh, one point, early doors versions. But anyway, the point is, it did have one. You, you went to meters, and then you went to RTA, and it had this thing here. Uh, and actually, very early on with the SQ console, so we're talking like over a, from when this video was done about two years ago, I'd um, sent Alan Heath a support request to say, look, can you put a setting in to slow the RTA down? Because at first it was like that which was just too ah crazy too fast uh, and then you know it just goes to show the the, the manufacturers that you know the better manufacturers do listen uh, if you if you say sometimes can you you know make feature recommendations so they they put um this uh, average um feature in so you could slow that crazy RTA down and now they've taken it even further because uh, as an overlay on the PEQs you've got an RTA so uh, no signal at the moment because nothing's playing, but I mean, if I selected here is my uh, mic right now, there's the RTA running real-time analyzer on this console. Great, great. Uh, and we've got some settings as well, so you can slow that thing down. Uh, and also you can get it to take readings off, uh, off the peak uh, and then various visual things that you can do with that overlay also. More on that would be for another video. Right now, though, we're going to use it to identify where we think the troublesome areas of this uh, vocal as it shifts are. And this is just going to verify what our ears originally thought. So here we go. I'll do this chronologically. Firstly, it's this filter that it's in this region here that I believe needs dampening. And then in this region, 
I believe we need to uh, reduce that in level. So when he goes higher, it's here, and then when he goes lower, it's there. So here it is. My mind I'm being um, deliberately super attenuative to highlight what area we're on about there. Uh, so I believe there's initially too much energy up here. And so I would have my dynamic EQ work in this region. And also, as he goes lower with that phrase, this area. Uh, my, my And part of the reason why I don't want to use the EQ across the whole track, this parametric EQ, is highlighted there because it does actually take something away from the vocal. It makes it sound a little hollow and a little bit uh, weaker by doing that cut. So I don't want that all the time, just as he uh, comes toward the end of that phrase and because of the way his head's moving off mic when he's doing it, it's obviously uh, giving his head a bit of a wobble, uh, then we, it's just at that point that I want that attenuation to come in. So there you go. Um, some, some listening skills to identify what you think is standing out as a bit uncomfortable, uh, a bit bit not great on the ear, and then um, some verification with a PEQ and an RTA overlay. And that's the thing as well. You'll probably be listening to this in headphones or on some sort of um, smaller playback device. Uh, and yet, what we need to bear in mind, this would be on a big PA system at gig. And big PA systems, when you're running it loud, you know, people potentially are, are, are riskier with the, with the rears um, and you're the person who needs to do some protection of that. So when we get those moments of uh, overload, and when I say overload, it's not, it's not system overload, but it's actually you're overloading people's ears, really, with certain parts of the, uh, of, of the tonal spectrum at certain points. And that's uncomfortable. And it becomes, I believe that it becomes even more uncomfortable as the systems get, well, louder, basically. Well, let's get to the thrust of this uh, little introduction video to Dynamic EQ then. So we'll switch off the parametric EQ and we'll go to effects and here's a Dynamic EQ. So to give a Dynamic EQ introduction, well, this is Dyn EQ4, Allen and Heath, and it's got four filters and basically those filters work as for individual compressors. So let's take, for example, a uh, light blue band here, filter number two from the left. So in terms of control, well, it will do gain reduction when the incoming signal passes the threshold. So if we put some signal into the system, uh, the threshold is set at minus 12 currently and the signal is passing it at certain moments and causing some gain reduction to take place. Uh, let's just begin with the thing not doing anything and then this dark blue band, next one along, bring that up to zero. Okay, so you have a threshold. The difference of course, and, and the ratio as well, effectively, that's what this comp one is here. Um, one of the differences, well, the main difference between the broadband compressor is that we, effectively we've got four compressors here. Uh, so they're frequency conscious compressors and we can uh, have gain reduction taking place. Dynamically just means uh, when certain parts of the tonality go over the threshold. So how do we set it up? Well, we'll go back to our light blue band and we'll go uh, for filter and we can roll this around. I've decided it's somewhere near the mid mid range, late 500s, maybe closer towards six. So the circuit's in, uh, no processing at first, but I'll bring down the threshold and begin doing some gain reduction. I'm only looking for gain reduction to take place when he holds onto that note and he goes lower with it. So it's at that moment that I want the game reduction to take place. But I don't really want game reduction to take place for the rest of the track. 
You can see it quite obviously the uh, horizontal bias showing gain reduction and I'm watching that and I'm pulling it down and based on my listening before and what the parametric EQ with its RTA overlay was backing up that when he goes, he's going, when he's coming down, uh, the lower part of that uh, is somewhere in the mid range, and there's too, too, there's more than enough of that. And, and the thing is, it just it that's making it sound different when he's moving on and off axis. So I want to try and level that out a bit. So that's that one. Uh, I'll do the other filter, and then we'll switch it in and out, see whether we feel it's actually doing the job that it's supposed to be. Is it really profound, or is it just really subtle, or it doesn't make no difference at all? Let's find out. So we'll go to our next band. We've got filter width as well to think about. That's my starting point, though. I'll leave the filter widths where they are, and we'll take a listen. Circuit in, circuit out, circuit out first. <laughs> What do we think then? Subtle, at most subtle. I'm just going to move the width of the filter slightly and also the uh, center frequency. The uh, lighter blue one in the mid-range fill is doing uh, what I want it to do. Uh, it's just taking away some of the energy at that lower note that he heads down to, but it's the higher stuff still uh, needs a little bit of smoothing out. Guys, we've got to remember, uh, these are subtle changes in our headphones, but the thing about level management on big PA systems is um, it, when it's... Uh, this was meant to be a, a, a big show, right? Loud PA system, rock and roll PA system. Well, uh, these extra bits of level that you get unnecessarily, this bit of... It's just out of control for no particular reason. I mean, some dynamics are good and exciting, but they should be managed. And uh, this is unnecessary electronic uh, level adjustment, uh, electronic in so much as it's to do with the electronics of the sound reinforcement. It's to do with the microphone and the head mo and the fact that the microphone has directionality, a lot of directionality. And when the head goes off axis, it just it just doesn't sound the same. So that's to do with the sound reinforcement system. It's not the intention of the vocalist necessarily. So we're gonna, we can we can bring this in a little bit. Uh, so I'm just gonna leave it playing. My mic's gonna mute. Uh, and that seems about the point to leave it for now because throughout all of the phrase, except from the last bits where I feel uh, I've got an issue with, there's very little gain reduction taking place. What I mean is I'm hoping to bring that last part of the phrase more under control uh, within these two regions, but I don't want to 
frankly mess up the rest of the track. You know, I don't want to spoil uh, the w- w- what otherwise I might not know is a problem. What I mean by that is it's live performance. I don't really know what he's going to do for the rest of the show. I just know in soundcheck that he's doing this and I've recognised it and I've put those filters in. In, re- in reality, of course, in, in the soundcheck, if we get a soundcheck, we're, we're, we're doing all right. Like, he might not even get one of them. Um, or certainly don't get the lead vocalist performing as he would do in the real show in the soundcheck. So a lot of this stuff, um, it's like this blue one, it's ended up pretty wide. Um, whereas a dynamic EQ could be really pinpoint, uh, more so like the light blue one. But uh, I mean, what? I'm going to sit here and listen to it on loop anymore. It's going to get, it's going to get, go way beyond the scope of of um, the majority of situations. Particularly, you know, with with, the, with this band, for example, I'm not doing a technical rehearsal for them. This is just uh, something that this is a process that we could we're looking at using potentially reactively uh, during a sound check. Now, something that's going to clamp this overall uh, and make uh, pro- possibly actually a more profound difference after that, after that dynamic processing with the dynamic EQ, uh, it would be some broadband compression. So I will just so I'll switch this on. I'll raise this up. Actually, just by standard three to one is sensible for what I'm about to do, and also the attack. Uh, that text probably if reasonable. Uh, let's find out. So here we go. So I don't want people to know that processing is taking place. I don't want to distract from the natural source too much. I just want to put it back under control because, let's be honest, the sound reinforcement electronics changed it anyway. Um, So I want to bring this... I want to clamp this, I want to preserve headroom, and I want to preserve people's ears. So taking a few dB off broadband after the fact, and this does come after the insert, um, is uh, is what I would do with that. And if we were to take all that processing off and run it without, and then listen with it, let's see if we have saved a bit of headroom. Could be too much. Okay, so we did some leveling and we did some frequency conscious leveling. 